in this presentation, we'll go over how to use Python to replicate the post earnings announcement drift finding from Bernard and Thomas, 1989. First, an introduction to the paper. Post earnings announcement drift is the phenomenon of a rise or fall in the cumulative abnormal return of firms after an announcement of high or low unexpected earnings, respectively. The main cause of this drift is the inefficiency of the market, with investors unable to process announcements immediately. In Barnard and Thomas 1989, they found that the drift is most significant immediately following the announcement, but can last up to hundreds of days. However, with the improvements in technologies and understandings of the market, the market has become increasingly efficient in the 2020s than in the 1980s, so we investigate the drift in a more recent time setting. The key component that we are using for this research is the CAR, or Cumulative Abnormal Return. To calculate the CAR, we first define the abnormal return, which is equal to the raw return of the firm subtracted by the expected return. And here we split firms into 10 size deciles and take the average return of each day for the firm's decile to be its expected return. Finally, the CAR is simply the sum of the abnormal returns over time in days. Although this may feel intuitively inaccurate because return is usually compounded, previous studies, including Bernard and Thomas 1989 and Foster Olson and Shevlin 1984, have both found that summing abnormal returns yields a similar result to compounded CAR. Next, we'll go over a quick overview of the results of our replication. So we replicate figures two through five and tables one through four from the paper. Let's first scale this down to size. In figures two, three, and four, we plot the 60 day car before and after the earnings announcement date, henceforth RDQ for all firms, big firms and small firms respectively. They all show a similar trend, a way shorter period of drift than what Bernard and Thomas found in 1989, with the drift ranging from three to 20 days only. In figure five, we plot the average car for the highest and lowest SUE de decile, which are the good news and bad news firms from the RDQ respectively on each quarter we analyze. And so we'll quickly show you figure five. So this is figure two B car after RDQ for all firms. Figure three, cumulative abnormal return for SUE portfolio this is for big firms, right? In figure three, the car of big firms from 60 days before the earnings announcement date to the RDQ and the car from the RDQ to 60 days after the RDQ are plotted in 10 different line graphs, each representing the average car for the corresponding SUE decile of big firms ranked in NYSE slash Amex firms prior quarter SUE scores. Panel A illustrates the pre-announcement period car while panel B illustrates the post-announcement period car. So this is pre-announcement period as you can see, so from minus 60 days to day zero. And then this is the post announcement period, which is from day zero to day 60. And this is all in event time. So as you can see, this decile where the firm really significantly beat earnings um, had a big SUE did much better than this decile where the firm really missed earnings. Uh, in figure four, the car of small firms from 60 days before the earnings announcement date to the RDQ and the car from the RDQ to 60 days after the RDQ are plotted in 10 different line graphs, each representing the average car for the corresponding SUE decile of small firms ranked in NYSE slash Amex firms prior quarter to SUE scores. Panel A illustrates the pre-announcement period car while panel B illustrates the post-announcement period car. So you can see in the pre-announcement period, there's a pretty significant run up for the top performers versus the worst performers. And then you can see after, uh, even after there is a, um, again, a pretty significant run up. Sorry, this is this is after, so 60 days after the new announcement, there's again a pretty significant run up. Um, And for the, for the firms that don't do quite as well, 
they you know they immediately struggle and then they bounce back a little bit uh with respect to figure five in figure five the average car of long short positions those in the highest lowest sue decile were plotted for every quarter of data analyzed it's important to note that in the original paper this figure had two panels to compare two sue strategies well here it is it has not significant meaning other than replicating a similar table Okay, now in um, table one, we evaluate the longevity of the post earnings announced drift and again find the period to be significantly shorter than that from Bernard and Thomas 1989. And so in table one, the average car for a certain 15 day holding period relative to the earnings announcement date is recorded for each size and SE portfolio along with the difference between high extreme good news and low extreme bad news, SUE firms. The size and SUE portfolios are assigned as follows. Size based on market equity at the start of the calendar year, SUE based on analyzed quarters, or analyst quarters SUE position and prior quarter SUE distribution. Panel A includes both the pre-announcement and post-announcement period, while panel B includes holding periods of different lengths to analyze the longevity of post earnings announcement drift. The periods used in this table are significantly shorter than that of Bernard and Thomas 1989 because of the shorter drift period observed in figures two to four. So as you can see, we have, right, so these are the different holding periods, negative 59 days to negative 45 days, negative 44 to negative 30, dot, 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 all the way up to 46 to 60 and 61 to 75. And then this is how each of the portfolios does. Um, okay, now in table two, we run a regression. Uh, sorry, I just want to look at this for a second. So, so this is basically talking about small, so small stocks with high, the highest decile for beating, right? So this is a pretty good return in the first 15 days. And then this is small stocks with low decile. So this is, they did the worst. Um, the, they did very poorly over the 15 days following our announcement. Um, and then this for small stocks, it's a difference between high and low. Now one, you now some might ask, well, what's the deal with this? Why is this so much bigger in absolute value than this? And the answer is likely that these, these stocks may be expensive to short. And then, so if we look at uh, medium sized stocks, sure enough, you can see the high minus the low, right? So, so you can see there's not as big a difference here. And that's likely because these are less expensive to short. Um, and then for, for B and H, this is big, relatively big firms. And this is right. And then BL, this is somewhat surprising, right? that because these stocks are probably also relatively expensive to short. So the question is, why is there such a negative reaction to this earnings mess? Okay. Um, and then this is the post announcement holding period. And so we can see S diff. Uh, so in the one to 15 days has the best return. But again, we're a little concerned that the shorted costs here medium diff so again this is pretty good and then big diff this is again pretty good because it's very likely these firms have um low cost of shorting so this is an interesting result right here we see in the you know in the 15 days there's still a return here for big firms um okay now in table two we run a regression on a one factor model the beta estimate of each sue decile and so table two shows the beta coefficients for the regression results of the cumulative compounded daily raw return on the equity risk premium for different SUE deciles and holding periods. This table shows the extent to which a one-factor model can explain the post-earnings announcement drift. Panel A records the beta values while panel B analyzes them to get rank correlation in Jensen's alpha. So what we want to know is basically, is there Jensen's alpha, which means are our results explained simply by though a one factor model which is which is effectively the cap m 
And so in the post announcement period for SUE Decibel 10, we can see they typically have a beta of 1.48 and SUE Decibel 1, they have a beta of 1.97. And then here it's 1.95 for the 160 period, and here's 1.59. And so basically what this is saying is, you know, if if we our results were being driven by beta, then we would expect to find that these betas are quite different, right, from, from here. Um, and we don't really... We don't really see that, right? These sort of best performing firms that then go on to do very well, they don't have a much higher beta than these lower, than these firms who don't quite do as well. And in fact, the firms that do the worst, they actually have the highest beta. And so that help makes us think that our, these sort of excess returns that you're seeing in the 60 window is not driven by the one factor model. And then so panel B, rank correlation in Jensen's alpha for beta estimates. So what we want to see here is that Jensen's alpha is statistically significant. And so we have Jensen's alpha for SUE is negative 0 0.052. And then we have Jensen's alpha for SUE is negative 0 0.011. So it seems like... Um, if this is more powerful, the Jensen's alpha is larger for SUE one. And if you short, if you take the difference between them, we get a Jensen's alpha of 0 0.041. And then we want to make sure that this alpha is statistically significant. Okay. In table three, we run a regression on a five factor model with factors from Fama French 2014. For both these regressions, we get similar results to Bernard and Thomas 1989 that these models do not sufficiently explain the drift. So again, what we want to do is we want to see that this alpha is uncorrelated from the Fama French five factors. And so we want to make sure that this alpha is um, statistically significant. So in table three, regression results of two regressions are displayed. The dependent variable is the 30 day car and the independent variables are Fama French's factors. Um, SMB, HML, RMW, CMA, and either risk-free premium or market. The T values of each coefficient is shown next to the coefficients. Um, so what we're doing is we're regressing 30 day car on the Fama French five factors. And so similar to Bernard Thomas 1989, we find insignificant weak correlations between car and the factors. Um, in table four, we compare the annualized cumulative raw returns for different portfolios on different holding periods. Once again, we find that the drift is more volatile in the first few days with a way shorter period. So in table four, the average cumulative raw return for different holding periods after the earnings announcement date, which is called RDQ, is recorded for each size and SUE portfolio, along with the average of high SUE good news and low SUE bad, firm, bad news. The size is based on market equity at the start of the calendar year, S equals small, um, M equals medium and big equals top three. SUE based on analyzed, based on analyst quarters, SUE position and prior quarter, SUE distribution. H is high, L is low. The difference is H minus L. Panel A shows the bad news firms, raw returns and cumulative raw returns, demonstrating how we calculate annualized cumulative raw returns. Panel B, we compare the annualized cumulative raw returns for bad news and good news firms. So again, we're interested in small, um, medium, and big firms, and we're interested in whether they have sort of low performance relative to analyst earnings or high performance relative to analyst earnings. But again, this is this panel is just for bad news. So we see that you know the small bad news firms do do pretty bad. The medium bad news firms do the worst. And the biggest bad news firms do, uh, okay, and this do sort of the best. And this may be, I mean, still negative, but the best. And this may be because the cost of shorting is so expensive um, for small and possibly medium. 
And now we want to compare bad news and good news firms, annualized cumulative all returns. And so here we see table four suggests the same results as figures two to four, that the post earnings on the drift is much more instantaneous than before and is more volatile for small firms. Um, okay, so yeah, you can see like for a small high, right? So these are small firms that, that did very well. Um, in, you know, the first five days, they had a quite a big um, cumulative average return. And then in the first five days for small low, they had quite a, uh, you know, a drastic drawdown in the first five days. And then it, for big high, it more, or for small high, it levels off, but still, um, or actually return, it goes, you know, uh, goes down, right? And for these guys, it, um, these guys recover somewhat. Um, okay. So now back to the code that can help us understand that. Next, we'll go over the code that got us these results. So like any other Python project, we first connect Google Drive and import Python libraries and define global variables. Next, we import our crisp data, which includes the type of exchange and return data. And uh, when we print out the columns, it looks like this. Uh, then we clean the crisp data. We first convert variable types, and then we filter with the following criteria. Data is after 2019. Firms are U.S.-based common stocks. Firms use NYSE or Amex exchange types. And firms have more than four fiscal quarters of data. Next, we import CompuStat data, which includes the RDQs. We then clean the data. Filtering for data after 2019 again, we also add the market value common, which is equal to shares outstanding times close price. Next, we merge the two data frames in a SQL left join and add columns for the calendar year and quarter. Then we rank the firms by their market value at the start of the year and add the decile data. In the third line, we ensure that we take the start of the year data for the market value by using the dot first function for a group by object. We can then add the abnormal return for each row of data. We do so by calculating the average return of firms from the same size decile on each day and subtracting it from a firm's raw return on that day. Next, we import the IBES surprise history data, which includes each firm's SUE score for that quarter. And we clean the data, filtering for data after 2019 and quarterly earnings per share data. We also add the corresponding CompuSet data date for each SUE by setting it to the last day of that month. We then merge the SUE data back into the main data frame using the data date we previously added to IBES. Next, we use the shift function to add SUE decile data from the prior quarter to avoid survivorship bias in our data. Again, we use a group by object to make the SUE decile assignment easier. Now that we have the SUE decile values from the previous quarter, we can assign each row of data an SUE decile. However, we must use a for loop since we are ranking SUE in the prior SUE decile column. So we cannot simply use the rank function like we did with size deciles. Finally, we left join the data back into the main data frame based on the year and quarter of the data. Now that we have all the data we need, we can begin replicating Bernard and Thomas 1989 results. First, we try to replicate figures two through four, plotting the car of the 60 day windows before and after the RDQ. We calculate the cumulative abnormal returns for all firms with the following code. This is not the most efficient way of getting the car, but since our data frame is not that large, this method, one that comes to mind first, is sufficient for this replication. 
we make an array of length 11, index 0 to 10, to store cars for each decile. With a for loop, we add the before and after data to the corresponding arrays. It is important to check that the indices are in the abnormal return data frame with the if statement inside the for loop to make sure we don't run into errors by accessing invalid indices. Then we create a 2D array index 0 to 10 and 0 to 60 and add all of our car data according to the corresponding SUE decile and number of days relative to RDQ. And we convert the car array before to data frames so we can plot them. We subtract 60 from the index to get the correct corresponding day value in the x-axis. And we also multiply the average car by 100 to obtain percentage data rather than the decimal. Finally, we plot the data with the df.plot function, rename the x and y labels, and store it in our Google Drive folder. And we repeat the plotting process for the data after RDQ. This is our graph for all firms' car after the RDQ. Next, we repeat the whole process, both before and after the RDQ for big firms. This is our graph for big firms' car before the RDQ. Repeat steps 10 to 12 for big firms. And this is our graph for big firm's car after the RDQ. We also repeat, we also repeat the process for small firms. Here, our graph for small firms before the RDQ. And then we repeat steps 10 to 12 for small firms. And here is our graph for small firms after the RDQ. And again, RDQ is the earnings and after date. So finally, we repeat the process for medium firms, but we don't need to plot it since it was not included in Bernard and Thomas 1989. So you can use the code on the screen to repeat the process for medium firms. Uh, these are our two resulting data frames for medium-sized firms. You can see here's our first one, and here's our second one. Now that we are done with figures two through four, we move on to table one. We use a similar method to generate car data for 15-day periods, shortened due to our observations in figures two through four, which had shorter drift periods. The difference here is that instead of storing data for every day within the period, we only care about the car at the end last day of each period. So we append only the car from the last day to our data. We take the average time, the average times 100 again, to get the average car on each end of our period. In slide 40, we use this process for big, medium, and large firms to gather data for table one. Then we print out table one neatly with the following code. It helps us generate table one. And then uh, we can then copy the data by hand onto a docx to follow the correct table format. And the final table should look like this. Again, this shows a short drift period with most, if not all, of the drift completed within the first 15 days for all three size portfolios. Next, we run the five-factor regression for table three. To do so, we filter for only extreme bad news, SUE decile one, and extreme good news, SUE decile 10, and get the abnormal returns again. Uh, now we get the 30-day and 60-day after RDQ car data with the date to replicate table three and figure five. We then import the Fama French five factor data to run the regressions. After cleaning the Fama French data, we merge it into the 30 day period data frame and run regressions on two types of five factors, one with equity risk free premiums and one with the market returns. On the right, we have our regression results. So this is our table three after putting it in the correct format. 
the R square value is only 0 0.003 for both regression, suggesting that the five factor model does not sufficiently explain the car draft. We also plot this. We also plot the 60 day data with a bar graph based on their year and quarter. We do so by adding a new column combining the year and quarter. Next, we move on to replicating table two which analyzes raw returns instead of abnormal returns. So this block of code simply replaces our previous codes, abnormal returns with raw returns. Again, we repeat the same process for every por for portfolio. On the right here is our cumulative raw return of the end of each 60-day period, starting with indexes the first day. Now we print out the information needed to complete table four. Here is table 4A. Here is table 4B. This shows us the most volatile returns Occur in the first five days and afterwards the drift stops quickly after 20 to 40 days depending on the SUE and size portfolio of the firm. Finally, we replicate table two. To complete our replication, we first merge our frame of French data into our main data frame and convert the values to decimal. Uh, one might have noticed that we repeated processes many times in our previous code and that always a hint to use functions. However, we only had to repeat a process a maximum of six times, so functions were, although a neater solution, not necessary. However, for table two, we must run 60 regressions on 60 different generated data sets, so we define a function to return these data sets. The parameters of the data sets are the starting day of the return window, the ending day of the return window, and the RDQ date to analyze. Then we take mostly the same approach as previous code to get the compounded return data at the end of a period. The biggest difference is that we are using cumulative products instead of cumulative sums since we are compounding the return. Also, we add in the risk-free premium and treasury bill rate since those are the independent variables in our regression. We subtract the treasury bill rate from the cumulative return to get the dependent variables column, and we take the risk-free premium to be the independent variable. Finally, we run the regression for each SUE decile to obtain the beta estimates. Here are the first two results of our regressions, but we should have a total of 60. We first record the beta estimates in a file called table 2A, and then we can import it again and run the Spearman rank correlation table, or Spearman rank correlation test with the code on the right. Here is table 2A from the regression results. Here is table 2B with the Spearman rank correlation test results. As expected, there are slight correlations between the returns and risk-free premium, but it cannot solely explain the drift. So that is our replication of the post-earnings announcement drift uh, from Bernard and Thomas 1989. I hope you found this helpful. This is a very common risk factor, and this will be important for you to know. Have a great day and see you in the next video.